Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Sia Donishman. I'm a, um, a professor of urology at USC. And uh, today I have uh, two of my uh, very good colleagues, uh, Ann Schuckman from USC and uh, Seema Porton from uh, UCSF. And, and we're just going to talk briefly about this uh, uh, research study that recently came out on the evaluation and real world use of uh, clinical utility of the CX bladder monitor uh, in follow up of patients uh, who are um, uh, being surveyed for, for bladder cancer. So welcome guys, I'll just go through the slides and uh, then ask you a few questions uh, at the end. Um, you two were uh, co-authors of the study and I'm sure you have some insights to, to share. So uh, we, we all know that um, surveillance of uh, recurrent urothelial carcinoma requires frequent cystoscopies, um, it can be expensive, it's time consuming, patients don't like it. And, and if we had an accurate biomarker that could potentially reduce at least the number of cystoscopies that we, we do for the patients, it could be certainly a, a very attractive uh, uh, for the patients. And the objective of this, this study was to audit the clinical util utility of this new surveillance protocol incorporating CX bladder monitor in a, in a real world practice. Uh, this was done in New Zealand in three hospitals. Uh, they had a new surveillance protocol and the patients were risk stratified and provided urine samples for this monitor, uh, CX bladder monitor testing. Uh, the low risk CS, CX uh, monitor positive patients and all high risk patients had cystoscopies every two to three months, which is pretty much um, the, the schedule we have uh, for these patients. The low risk CX bladder monitor negative patients had cystoscopies uh, at 12 months. Um, so here's the algorithm here. You see again, low risk is equal to low, low grade TA and high risk would be anything other than uh, low grade TA. So patients treated for urothelial carcinoma, you can see on the left side, if you were low risk, uh, you got a CX bladder monitor. If the bladder monitor was negative, then you went on to flexible cystoscopy at 12 months uh, and then followed that way. If you were positive, then you had flexible cystoscopy every two to three months. And of course, if you were high risk, uh, whether or not uh, you were positive or negative, everybody was undergoing flexible cystoscopy at the standard uh, surveillance uh, protocol. So this was a way to decrease at least the patients with low risk cancers uh, who had negative CX bladder monitor uh, uh, to have uh, cystoscopy at a, at a uh, later uh, date. So there were 443 urine samples. It's a, a good sample size uh, from 309 patients and, and most of them were low risk, 52 were high risk. Uh, during a 35 month audit. And uh, uh, about three quarters of the patients, um, of the low risk patients, had negative CX bladder results. Therefore, cystoscopy was deferred uh, for an average of, of about 10 months. And over this time period, uh, pathology confirmed low grade TA tumors were found in only three of the 196 patients with, uh, who had the initial negative CX bladder monitor result. That's 1.5%. 98.5% of them did not have a recurrence uh, and none were observed at the first cystoscopy uh, after the CX bladder testing. Of the ones who were uh, low risk, the 57 who had a positive CX uh, monitored result, CISTA was performed you know, around three months as we talked about and three tumors were identified. Uh, fortunately, there were no false negatives as we've seen in previous studies. Um, uh, and, and all the patients were sort of adjudicated properly into these um, uh, categories. So again, here's a sort of a graphical format. You had uh, 257 low risk patients, the CX monitor result, 196 um, uh, uh, were negative, 108 underwent cystoscopy, uh, and none of them were, were positive. So none, none of them had recurrent tumor. Of the ones who were who had CX monitor positive results, so 57 patients there, uh, most of them underwent cystoscopy and three tumors were found. Again, I'm just reiterating the results in, in these high-risk patients, everybody underwent the standard uh, sort of three, two to three month cystoscopies. And you can see that if you were CX bladder monitor negative, um, again, no tumors were missed, even in the high-risk patients. Uh, and the ones who were positive, you found four, four tumors in these, in these patients. So uh, really great results. And, and you can see it um, uh, when you integrate it in, into evaluation of the surveillance for, for bladder cancer patients, it really accurately rules out patients who don't have recurrent uh, urothelial carcinoma. I think that's probably the, the uh, biggest advantage of this uh, test is to rule out these patients. 
uh, and perhaps give them uh, some peace of mind that there's no recurrence without having to do an invasive test. Um, this does allow low-risk patients to safely undergo cysto at longer than recommended uh, intervals. Uh, we can talk a little bit about the AUA versus the EAU guidelines and, and what they recommend. Um, so, you, you know, there is an opportunity, I think, here to, to reduce the cystoscopy burden for some of these patients at least um, and spare them the, you know, the discomfort. Um, so, uh, importantly, none of the 35 patients, I mean, I'm sorry, none of the patients during the 35-month follow-up uh, progressed to invasive disease or metastases, obviously, no cancer-specific uh, mortality. Uh, and and th this is an older, older cohort. Um, and you can see the distribution there. So really, I, I just want to get right into the, to, to the discussion here um, and uh, ask, you know, where, uh, Seema, let me start with you, put you on the spot. <laughs> Uh, where do you, how do you use this test? Um, do you use it routinely? Do you use it um, uh, on some patients, but not others? Tell us how, how you use it. Yeah, so um, in terms of use here at UCSF, we, we actually launched a, a similar type of um, surveillance program for specific patients. So these are patients who who primarily had lower tract disease, so no patients who were getting cystose for a history of upper tract disease. Uh, those who were diagnosed um, had their initial diagnosis uh, greater than six months, and those if they had a recurrence that was greater than nine months. And we start we we actually launched this and and did this with a couple of patients in February of 2020. And it was the in-home sampling system. So one of the issues that kind of came up was when a patient came or drove all the way to UCSF, paid for parking, kind of checked in, did that whole rigmarole, right? That's expensive, uh, right, at UCSF? It, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they weren't going to leave the clinic without the system, right? Um, the, it was not um, uh, amenable for them to just come and drop off a urine sample. So with the advent of an in-home sampling system where, where the test is essentially FedExed uh, to someone's house, that allowed us to launch this a little more effectively here. What then happened a few weeks after we, we had you know, enrolled a few patients is the pandemic hit. And this actually became a, a huge blessing for us. And so with similar inclusion criteria, because we were asked to reduce the number of inpatient visits, we were still able to do cystoscopies um, for, for uh, high-risk patients who had been um, diagnosed within six months or nine months for the recurrence. But for this other group of patients, we were able to really launch this in-home sampling system. And we have an abstract that we submitted to the AUA. We haven't heard back, but we have data on about 50 to 60 patients who, who kind of had this in a, in a two and a half month period. And in, in all of those patients, the majority, 70%, were AUA intermediate and high risk. Um, so it was a little higher risk group of patients. Um, every single one of them has had their follow-up cysto at the, at the next timed interval, and no one has had any recurrence um, that was noted in, in when they were uh, CX monitor negative. We did bring those patients in who were CX monitor positive, um, and that was about 33% of the whole group. And of those patients who we brought in, seven needed had findings that needed to go for, um, for cysto and biopsy in the operating room. So we were really able to uh, figure out who needed to come in urgently, particularly in a period where our resources were limited. Well, well that's, that's tremendous. I mean, that, that, that pretty much mirrors exactly this study result, right? Uh, the more results we get from different centers and different studies, the, the more confident we are and, and hence we'll be able to uh, share that confidence with the patient that look, you know, zero is amazing uh, uh, results when you have like, no missed cancers, even in the, in the low grade. Uh, you brought up a slightly uh, higher risk category. And let me ask you, you're, you're gonna be leading some trials here in the intermediate risk uh, uh, patient population here. How do you feel about uh, including some intermediate risk patients, uh, the AUA intermediate risk patients, so recurrent low grades and, and some small high grade tumors? Yeah, I mean, I actually think that that's a perfect population where we can try to work towards the intensification of surveillance. Um, I think that this 
study really targets particularly the recurrent um, TA patient who is an intermediate risk patient. And if you could, you know, limit your surveillance somewhat in those patients, it would it would be fantastic. I actually do use CX in my practice in higher risk patients, particularly with carcinoma in situ, where I find that many times even my cystoscopy is really equivocal or cytology is equivocal. And um, I do find that that's a place where I find CX to be helpful. And, and that doesn't necessarily limit the need for cystoscopy, but certainly limits the need for subsequent trips to the operating room um, to biopsy patients. Yeah, I think that's very important. Uh, one of the places I use it most is when I have equivocal results. You know, uh, Ann and I have blue flex. Actually, all three of us have uh, flexible blue light cysto. Um, and sometimes you know you're not quite sure. You you have this uh, intermediate risk patient who has some red patch, and you're using blue light, and it's it's equivocal. I think you know that's uh, an area where uh, CX really helps because I'm not sure whether I want to take this patient to the OR. They're on anticoagulation and so on and so forth. We have urine set aside uh, from before, so I'll just you know send the, the the CX monitor result, and if it's negative, that saves them the trip to the OR. I'm I'm comfortable uh, seeing them back um, you know at the, at the next interval, whether it's three months or, or four months. So these are, you know, additional uh, tools uh, that we have to, to help us um, uh, try, try to both increase the intervals between systos, but also in my mind, importantly, try to avoid those uh, biopsies. Um, Seema, do you, do you do biopsies in the clinic and how does that work for you? Yeah, I do do biopsies in the clinic, but, but you're right, our, our bladder cancer population, sometimes you can't if, if they're on anticoagulation, or they're having some difficulty um, um, just tolerating. And plus it, it also depends upon the like surface area or how many red patches, maybe, maybe it's maroon on blue light, not, not <laughs> pink, not, not, not clear, not but, but I'm still trying to figure out what, what to do about that. Um, for, for those patients, because the urine sample is collected before the cystoscopy as well and is set aside, we're able to uh, send that off also for, for CX to kind of adjudicate what we see. Um, we're lucky and our cytopathologists have really come together and um, follow the Paris classification system and, and have a pretty strong consensus. And so we can rely on cytology sometimes in those situations, but often if there are um, so many gray areas like the patient you described that, that I will send off the the like set aside urine for CX yeah. as well to kind of aid in the decision about what what risk do I really need to take um, right this person to the OR yeah, these are aids you know cytology has, has has great positive predictive value but but really not great negative predictive value when it's when it's when it's negative you still could have CIS and we've we've seen that in the flexible uh, blue light system trials where where uh, none of the thirteen patients. Uh, who had uh, uh, CIS detected by blue light had actual positive cytology. Some had atypical, but most of them had actually negative cytology. So we're picking up these things earlier. And it's good to know that CX uh, bladder monitor does not um, uh, increase uh, and does not uh, uh, miss these important cancers, even the low grade ones. And uh, last question um, for in home sampling. Um, how do you use it? Do you call patients ahead of time? You, you practice right next to me, but I'm not sure I, I know this. Um, so have you been using the in-home sampling system? So I use it some, and I, you know, I, I will say most of the time that is not the way I use it in my current practice, but I've found that during the pandemic with telemedicine, I've certainly been using it a lot more, um, for patients who, you know, just as Seema mentioned, fall in that category where they're, you know, several, um, months out or a year out from a last recurrence, and they certainly don't want to come in for a cystoscopy. I think that's an ideal situation um, for a low or even potentially intermediate risk patient. Um, I have sort of a unique new practice setting where I'm really interested in using CX, which is um, I go to a rural clinic that is several hours from USC, and many patients there are referred for hematuria. Um, and I'm only there once a month. And so this seems like a setting to me where I could really leverage an outpatient urine sample to stratify patients who then I want to book onto my schedule for a cystoscopy or, or not. Um, 
And to me, this is a really interesting way to extend the reach of, you know, sort of expertise in bladder cancer to, to areas where we're very poorly served. That's a great point. And I think we're going to do more and more of that in, in, the, in our future. Um, and and uh, this really helps us do those remote sort of uh, care for the patients um, and knowing that they can connect with us, especially through telecare and that we're sending them a test that, that is highly reliable, I think uh, uh, gives them a lot of confidence and certainly gives, gives me confidence that we're doing something, you know, they don't, they don't want to come in. So Carter, that we're not really putting off for too long, you know, the, the scope we need to be doing. Exactly. Exactly. And, and th th this, this study had great follow-up. Um, I think, you know, that the more and more we see these results, the more confident we'll, we'll become. And, and Seema, we look forward to uh, seeing that your, your manuscript and, and uh, collaborating with you as, as we uh, also have been doing this, uh, following your lead on this. Um, if any uh, other uh, last comments from, from you guys, otherwise we'll, we'll wrap up this session. I think my only last comment would be to really, you know, stress that this has very, very high negative predictive value and that, you know, it's almost unheard of to have a test that has such a high negative predictive value. And I think that should really give us a lot of confidence going forward in terms of, um, in terms of use for surveillance. I agree. Seema, any lasting uh, words of wisdom? Um, I agree with everything that you guys have said, I think with, especially with telemedicine, it allows us to um, not miss that connection point with the patient in terms of checking in uh, when, when you're kind of reporting the results of this. And, and thus far, it seems that the in-home sampling has worked quite well um, in that every patient has been able to submit a urine sample fairly successfully with, with a reliable results. Great. Well, thank you guys. It's certainly been fun. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, joining in the session. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sia. All right.